the chat section to a source sheet. Uh, can you, can everybody access that? I'll put another one, put it again. That's a source sheet to this class on Shir Hashirim. Um, oh. If you have a way to look at that, uh, if you're, if you know how to play around with the computer, you can do like a half screen, but if you don't, then that's fine too. Um, but that's, that's the source sheet we're going to be using for this class. Um, this is, this is a, this is an hour long class. Okay. So I'm going to try to cram it into 26 minutes. Okay. And this is original kind of like original material. So this is like my own approach to Shira Shirim. Nobody knows what song of songs is about. It almost didn't make it into the Tanakh. Um, almost didn't make it into the Tanakh because if you read it in a simple, like just like in a, as like a five-year-old kid, it just seems like almost like a, a very, um, very like a, a very colorful love story between a love between two lovers, and uh, and the sages didn't want to put it in the Tanakh because like this is just a lo like a secular love story. Rabbi Rabbi Akiva said that's a mistake. This is not a this is not a secular love story. This is the holy. This is holy of holies, and this needs to be put in the Tanakh. And it, and it made it into the Tanakh. Tradition uh, holds that um, Rabbi Akiva, uh, sorry that um, that Shlomo Melech wrote Shir Shirim, and and uh, and it contains deep secrets. The Sfardim will read Shir Shirim every Friday at Kabbalat Shabbat. Anybody know that? Mm -hmm. they, they do do that. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, and, um, and we, and a lot of people read it at the Seder. That's why I'm learning it right now. They'll read it at the Seder, Shir Shirim. So the question is, what's the story about and what can it come and teach us? So I, my inspiration for this class was I read this article, like this, ent these introductions to Shir Shirim, where they talked about how if you really pay attention, Shir Shirim is, has a lot of fragments has a lot of fragments, a lot of different stories within it. So what I, what I did was I kind of went through, I went through all the stories and I was like, I think there are recall like 17 or 18 or something like that, different fragments in Sierra Stream. And I kind of organized them into two categories. And, and I organized, and the two categories here, I kind of hint to like our relationship sometimes with God. And, and you could see through the love, the two lovers, Am Yisrael's relationship with Hashem and kind of like what, what can be some obstacles to our connection to Hashem. And these are hinted to also in Pesach, if you can get to that, uh, and, and sources connected to Pesach, if we can get to that at the end of the source sheet. So um, what I'd like to do is just, just jump into the source sheet. Again, those who have joined, I'm going to attach, attach it right now. Again, it's in the chat section. You can click on that. And basically, I'm just going to read through the source sheet. We can read through it together. Um, just before we start, I just want to see if anybody has any, any questions or anything that they're thinking about connected to Shira Shireem or anything. All right. Cool. So let's get going. Will, will you be singing this? Will I be singing this? No, but I have a nice mashup in store. I just have to record it. I'm going to sing one day today with Yachad. Yachad, Yachad. Go like there. Same theme. Anyway, all right, so that's a good question, though. So the, if you read Shishirim, you're going to see. The, the first part is about the love that's between the two lovebirds. It's a man and a woman in the, in the Song of Songs. So here are just some texts which talk about their love for each other. And they're, they're kind of similar. They're very de descriptive. So part one on page one, it says their mutual love. Uh, I've likened you, my darlings. This is the man speaking. To a horse in Pharaoh's chariots, very romantic. Your cheeks are comely with plated wreaths, your neck with uh, strings of jewels. We will add wreaths of gold to your spangles of silver. While the king, the woman says like this, while the king was on his couch, my nard gave forth its fragrance. My beloved to me is a bag of myrrh lodged between my breasts. My beloved to me is a spray of henna blooms from the vineyards of Engedi. Okay, so they're depicting each other in these de very descriptive manners. The man says back to her, ah, you are fair, my darling. Ah, you are fair with your dove-like eyes. So you see her cheeks, neck, 
eyes. It's very like uh, very uh, like uh, tangible, talking about like tangible things. And you, my beloved, are handsome, beautiful, indeed. So that's that's their back and forth. Now each of them has like a flurry of descriptions. And so again, these are from different parts of the story. They're like different different uh, different parts of the story and I brought them together because I think they all fall under one theme like they're descriptions of love for each other <clears throat> this is the man's description for the woman on um, part two uh, uh, CE2 you are fair my darling ah oh, you are fair my darling ah oh, you are fair your eyes are like doves behind your veil your hair like a flock of goats streaming down Mount Rod. your teeth are like a flock of ewes climbing up their washing pool all of them bear twins not one loses her young. I'm just going to mute everybody. Um, your lips are like a crimson thread. So you get the idea. It's someone who's probably, you may, if, you, if you go by the idea, it's King Solomon writing this. Maybe he had a time when he was working out in the field or whatever. Someone's using descriptions from, like, uh, from, she from the shepherd life lifestyle to depict their loved ones. Um, I wouldn't suggest doing this like that often. I don't know if it would go down that well, but um, I'm going to skip now to three. Such is my beloved. This is the woman speaking to the man. W means woman. My beloved is clear skinned and ruddy, preeminent among 10,000. His head is finest gold. His locks are curled and black as a raven. His eyes are doves by water courses, bathed in milk, set by a brimming pool. His cheeks are like heads of spices, beds of spices. Banks of perfume his lips. His hands are rods of, of gold, studded with beryl. So you get the idea. They're kind of like depicting each other in like these really descriptive ways. His legs are like marble pillars set in sockets of fine gold. Um, his mouth is delicious. I'm on page two. And all of him is delightful. Such is my beloved. Such is my darling, O maidens of Jerusalem. She wants everybody to hear. Okay, so everything's perfect right now. <coughs> It's great. It's just the descriptions of love, uh, kind of like them sharing their innocent, pure love for each other. And, and here's a, a number four is continues with that same theme. There are 60 queens and 80 concubines and damsels without number. Only one is my dove, my perfect one, the only one of her mother, the delight of her who bore her, made in sea and acclaim her queens and concubines and praise her. Okay, so that kind of sounds like Eshes Chayil. Yeah, Balave, Ahalala, praise her, uh, etc. Uh, acclaim her. So, again, that's like when you hear somebody when they they first find their their true love. Hopefully, this continues for their whole um, time together. But it's like this certain like descriptions. They talk to their friends. Oh, maidens of Jerusalem, I met this the greatest guy. You have to see, he's so this, he's so that. And then he's the only one I want forever. And so like, it kind of like, it's very um, like kind of childish, naive, beautiful, um, and pure. And that's kind of like one theme of the book. Another theme of the book is part two. And this is what I call push and pull. Where it's like, okay, maybe it's like a few years into the marriage, or maybe like they hit some bumps along the road. And it's kind of like, things aren't always as perfect as, <laughs> as we once thought they were going to always be. And this is, uh, and there are a few different aspects to this, a few different reasons which lead to that, that separating or that, that, that bumpiness. And so that's uh, part two. So I'm just going to maybe just pause a second and unmute if anybody has anything to share so far. Anybody, uh, no thoughts? Cool. All right. So we'll continue once. Um, all right, I'm muting again. All right, so, so this is, so if you pay attention, I took this next part all the way from the very beginning of the book. The book opens like this, okay? This is one, chapter one, verse one. Shira shiri imashe shlomo, song of songs by Solomon. A little singing, huh? I've got to bring it in there. Oh, isha ni mishiko pihu. Give me of the kisses of your mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. Okay, so he's the woman. She <coughs> asking him for the delights of his mouth. Your ointments yield a... So this sounds familiar, right? Uh, yield a sweet fragrance. All right, take care, Audrey. Um, 
Your name is like finest of oil. Therefore, do maidens love you? So he's expressing all these, uh, she's expressing all these uh, expressions like we saw before. Draw me after you. Yeah, uh, the king has brought me to his chambers. Okay, they're about to delight and rejoice, savoring him more than wine. The new wine, they love you. Like new wine, they love you. However, there's something that's holding her back. What's holding her back? I am dark, O oh, daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the pavilions of Solomon. Don't stare at me. Because I am dark-skinned, because the sun has gazed upon me. My mother's sons quarreled with me. They made me guard the vineyards, my own vineyard I did not guard. I had to work hard in the vineyards. I, had a, I got a bad tan. I don't know if this is like the simple meaning or there could be something deeper. I don't want to be seen. I don't want to be seen right now. As much as I want to be with you, I can't be with you because I'm feeling insecure. There's a certain expression of insecurity here. Tell me whom I love so well. Where do you pasture your sleep? Where do you rest them at noon? Let me not be as one who strays besides the flocks of your fellows. And he goes, if the man goes, if you do not know, O fairest of women, go follow the tracks of the sheep and grave your kids by the tents of the shepherds. Basically, <clears throat> she loves him. She wants to be with him. But she can't because she doesn't feel like she's worthy or she's comely or she's, comely or she's dark. Something she was outside too much. She was she uh, she was too tan. She can't be with him now. Although it's difficult for her, because she wants to be with him. So that's one source. I am dark. That's one reason why that would withhold them. It'd be an obstacle for them expressing that pure love that we saw in the beginning. Here's another one. <clears throat> uh, this is from chapter two, verses eight to seventeen. So again, these are all interspersed. I'm bringing them together. <clears throat> Hark, my beloved, there he comes. There he comes, leaping over mountains, bounding over hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or like a young stag, so she's excited. There he stands behind our wall, going through the window, peering through the lattice. My beloved spoke thus to me. And the man says, Arise, my darling, my fair one. Come away, for now the winter is past. Uh, the rains are over and gone. I mean, come away with me. Come, let's go together. Let's escape together. The blossoms have appeared in the land. The time of pruning has come. The song of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The green figs form on the fig tree. The vines in blossom. Page three. Give off fragrance. Arise, my darling, my fair one. Come away. Oh, my dove in the cranny of the rocks, hidden by the cliff. Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. Let me, your voice is sweet and your face is comely. So she answers, she, what should she say? Of course, I'll go away with you. Take me away and we'll leave this place forever to an enchanted, far away, uh, uh, beautiful location. No, catch us the foxes, she answers, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards. For our vineyard is in blossom. My beloved is mine and I am his who browses among the lilies. When the day blows gently and the shadows flee, set out, my beloved swifts as a gazelle, or young stag for the hills of spices. I understand this to mean that she has to go. She has to like go do some work. She's busy. Catch us the foxes, the little foxes. I have things to do. I can't come out to see you. We have to catch these foxes. <laughs> you want to take me away to this enchanted place? I can't do that right now. I'm overwhelmed. I have all these foxes. These little foxes are ruining our vineyard. I can't do it now. I'm sorry. <clears throat> for our vineyard is in blossom. I have things to tend to. I can't do it right now. I'm overburdened. So that's another source, another obstacle of connection. Not just insecurity, but being overburdened, overworked. That's another one. Now, the, the next one is um, number seven is the, sought the one I love. So the woman saying, upon my couch the night, I sought the one I love. I sought, but found him not. I must rise and roam the town. This is, uh, this is chapter three, verse one to five. This is uh, part, part seven. I must rise and roam the town through the town streets and through the squares. I must seek the one I love. Okay. She finally gets, this is after the previous source. The uh, previous source is verse chapter two, chapter three. She got her, she got her focus. She's ready to go. She says, I'm going to go try to find him. I sought, but found him not. But now once I finally went to go find him, I couldn't find him. I met the watchman who patrolled the town. Have you seen the one I love? Scarcely had I passed them. When I found the one I love, I held him fast. I would not let him go till I brought him to my mother's house and <laughs> to the chamber of her who conceived me. 
I adjure you, O maidens of Jerusalem, by gazelles or by, by, by hinds of the field, do not wake or, or rouse love until it please. So she finally rouses at night to find the one she loves, and she couldn't find him. And she ends up indeed finding him, um, and then they, they ended up coming together, and that's verse, source 8. Source 8 is, uh, is, them, uh, is them coming together. And this is actually, in my opinion, this is very descriptive. And if you see it, it's alluding to a sexual union. So you'll see what I'm saying. This could be maybe like a reason why they wanted to leave it out for other reasons. Maybe they thought it was a secular book they want to put in the canon, perhaps because of these descriptive sources. But if you pay attention, I think there's like a description, uh, description of like a sexual encounter. So they're able, and this is the back and forth, uh, going forward going back. She's looking for him. She can't find him. There are two sources we saw. She feels insecure. And number one, number two, she's busy. But they ended up coming together. That's seven and eight. <laughs> number eight happens like this. You have captured my heart, my own, my bride. You've captured my heart with one glass of, glance of your eyes, with, under your neck, with one coil of your necklace. How sweet is your love, my own, my bride. How sweet, more delightful your love than wine. Your ointment's more fragrant than any spice. Sweetness drops from your lips, O oh bride. Honey and milk, under your tongue, and the scent of your robes is like the scent of Lebanon. Try using that line. A garden locked in is, is my own, my bride. A fountain locked. Okay, so here is where I think he's describing like a sexual encounter. So he's saying a garden that's locked is my own, my bride. A fountain locked, a sealed up spring. Your limbs are an orchard of pomegranates and of all luscious fruits of henna, of nard, nard and saffron, fragrant reed and cinnamon, with all aromatic woods, myrrhs, and aloes, all the choice perfumes. You are a garden spring, a well of fresh water, a real of Lebanon. He, and, and she says, awake, O north wind, come, O south wind, blow upon my garden, that its perfume may spread. Let my beloved come to his garden and enjoy its luscious fruits. So you can see what this is alluding to, I think. I have come to my garden, my own, my bride. I have plucked my myrrh and my spice, eaten my honey and honeycomb, drunk my wine and my milk, eat lovers and drink, Drink deep love, drink deep of love, okay? It worked out. They got together. Finally, they were united after all the back and forth. But a third obstacle arises later on in the story. That's part nine. <clears throat> Let me just drink some Gatorade one second. We're getting to the good stuff. <clears throat> was I to down it again? Was I, that's, that's the topic. So the woman says, I was asleep. But my heart was wakeful. My beloved knocks. Let me in. So he's at the door. <coughs> they finally had their special night. You'd think they'd be able to finally get along and make it work. Not so simple. He comes to her house. Let me in. He's knocking. My darling, my, my faultless dove. For my head is drenched. It's wet outside. My locks are damp of night. Let me in. Guess what? I had taken off my robe. Was I to don it again? I had bathed my feet. Was I to soil them again? Meaning she's in her home. She's in the comfort of her own house. It's warm. She's comfy. She doesn't want to open the door. She doesn't want to start uh, to like bring in all the cold air. She doesn't want to get dressed. My beloved took his hand off the latch and my heart was stirred for him. So he left. You're going to be lazy. You're not going to come. You're not going to uh, extend yourself to me. I, I'm not going to stay here. It's cold. My, my, I'm damp. My locks are damp, uh, damp with the night. So he left. Guess what? She got up to search for him. I rode, uh, 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 the woman says, I rode to let my beloved in. My hands dripped myrrh, my fingers flowing myrrh upon the handles of the bolt. I opened the door for my beloved, but guess what? My beloved had turned and gone. I was faint because of what he said. I sought but found him not. I called, but he did not answer. I met the watchman who patrolled the town. She, she looked all over. Where is he? They struck me. They bruised me. The guards of the wall stripped me of my mantle. I admire you. I adjure you, O maidens of Jerusalem. If you meet my beloved, tell him this, that I am faint with love. She finally realized it, but it's too late now. And then the daughters of Jerusalem say this, Whither has your beloved gone, O fairest of women? Whither has your beloved turned? <coughs> Let us seek him with you. The woman said, my beloved has gone down to his garden, to the beds of spices, to browse in the gardens, to pick lilies. I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. Sound familiar? Anila do diva do di li. He browses among the lilies. So that's her hope, that she can once more reunite with him and connect with him. 
I call this the back and forth or the, uh, what is it? The, the, um, the push and pull. There's a push and pull here. They're back and forth and back and forth. They can't make it work. Nothing, it can't be consistent. And the question is, <clears throat> what's leading to the inconsistency? And what does this have to teach us for, for ourselves going into Pesach? Um, I just had this part three. I'm just going to un unmute it for a second. Um, let me just make this bigger. All right, so we're on part three right now. Anybody have anything um, to say about that or want us to keep kind of just keep on plowing forward? Uh, Rabbi, are, are, this is Jake. Are you um, are you keeping the exact order of the text? No. Okay, so I'm I'm just wondering if um, when it was accepted for the canon, did they intentionally change the order to make it less explicit? Or that's or, a great question. I don't know. I mean, I've been. I, mean, I don't know if there's other. For example, if there's. Um, um, like a text in the Dead Sea Scrolls that might be earlier than what we have, that might show some change. I, I don't know. Just, that's a good. That's a really good question. I've not done like academic research into Shear okay. Street, but if you pay attention, though, all the sources I brought on the push and pull, the back and forth, they're in sequential order. Okay. So, but there's stuff in between. So it's like stuff in between. Sometimes is like them expressing their, their like unbridled love for each other. So I took that out. I put it in its own section. Perhaps you can find a way to make it work within the, the, the sequence, but I took it out. But nevertheless, the other piece is like in order. All right, so I'm going to go back to that document. All right, so, so we're back in the document. Part, part three is, uh, is like the, the conclusion of the book, like near the, near the end of the book, is uh, for chapter seven, chapter seven, chapter eight. And basically the idea is that vast floods cannot quench love. It's a beautiful message. Like no matter what, we're going to be able to overcome these obstacles and we're going to be able to, to uh, manifest our love for each other. And uh, that's the message of Shir Shirim, I think. And that's the message for us. And I think that's why we read it on, on Shabbat, Arab Shabbat. We read it on, at the Pesach. It's a message of unity despite all the obstacles along the way. And so I'm going to read these, these, these entries here, 10, 11, and 12 on page 4. If only it could be as with a brother, as if you had nursed at my mother's breast, then I could kiss you when I met you in the street, and no one would despise me. I would lead you, I would bring you to the house of my mother. I am my beloved, and my desire is for me. Come, my beloved, let us go into the fields. Let us lodge among the hen of shrubs. I'm going to skip to number 12. This is like the main piece. Let me, let me be a seal upon your heart. Let the seal upon your hand. For love is fierce as death. Passion is mighty as Sheol. Its darts and darts are darts of fire, a blazing flame. Last, fast floods cannot quench love, nor rivers drown it. If a man offered all his wealth for love, he would be laughed to scorn. I think that's like the message that we're left with of the story, and maybe that's another reason why I made it into the, um, the canon. What I tried to do here <clears throat> with these last three sources was to go through <clears throat> biblical texts connected to Passover. This is like double layered. Go through biblical texts connected to Passover and then connect them to the three obstacles that are mentioned in Shir Shirim. So that's what I'm going to try to do. And these are three obstacles we can think about when it comes to trying to connect to God as Passover comes in. So the first one is self-doubt. Self-doubt appears in relation to Passover. It appeared when the woman said in the story, I'm dark, I don't want to be seen. This is, this is another version of it. It's in Shemot. This is number, uh, source number 13. It's in, it says, Shemot, God spoke to Moses and said to him, etc. God said, I'm going to free you. I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to take you out. That's all part A. That's the four languages of redemption. How did the nation respond? When, Hashem, when Moses told them part B, which is six, chapter, chapter 6, verse 9, when Moses told this to the Israelites, they would not listen to Moses. Their spirits crushed by cruel bondage. So, it could be just that they were overtired, but it also could be that they didn't believe anymore that they could be free. They were doubting the ability of God to save them from all the, the slavery that they, were, uh, that they were in. And this is an obstacle for, our, for ourselves experiencing freedom and liberation is that we don't believe that we're worthy of it. We doubt ourselves and we doubt our ability to experience and to uh, be able to achieve and arrive at better days or better times. So 
That's one obstacle to connection to God is self-doubt, as it appears in Shir Shirim and also in the story of, of Egypt. Another one is uh, like another, like a really fi- like a popular famous source. This is from Mesilai Shirim, The Path of the Just. And I'll just give you like the explanation on the outside. He basically says that Pharaoh, his main, uh, his main modus operandi was to keep the Jews so busy that they couldn't even think of escaping. That's why he put them through all that work. And the, and the Messiah Sharim says, that's the work of our yetzer, our evil inclination. It puts us through so much work, maybe in the workforce, uh, maybe at home, maybe worrying, keeps us so busy that we can't focus on our service of God. So just like the woman, the maiden in the story, she was overworked by taking care of all the foxes so she couldn't connect with her loved one. So too, we can be overworked in our, in our lives uh, with whatever we're doing. And that can withhold us from connecting to Hashem. Similarly, like today, we could be overworked with, overburdened with worries. And uh, it withhold us from finding ways to connect spiritually in these days to Hashem. Lastly is complacency and laziness. And this is just a source. Some people say the chametz hints to laziness. And that we have to remove the chametz to remove our laziness and our, our alacrity. In our, uh, it's, it's bread, uh, matzah is the bread of action and alacrity. As opposed to the chametz, which is the bread, uh, which is the bread of affliction or laziness. So I'm just going to read this last piece here on page six. The Egyptian culture had corrupted them so thoroughly. We are told, Jewish people were on the 49th out of 50 level tuma. They had tarried even the slightest bit; they would have missed their window. She almost missed her window. The maiden. She opened the door, but he wasn't there. She ended up finding him in the field. <coughs> but if you're lazy, you might miss your opportunity. And that's the message of Passover. They have to be quick, connect to Shem, and grab onto the spiritual opportunities that we can, and not let laziness withhold us from that, from that happening. Because Hashem's always knocking on our door. We just have to know, uh, we have to open it up and be open to Hashem and welcoming Hashem with all of the difficulties that that involves, including cleaning for Passover, getting ready mentally, and, and trying to stay spiritual in these crazy times. So I think those are a few messages we could take away from Shia Shireen for Pesach and for our days uh, today.